Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show for March 27th, 2019. The grind continues, and oh boy, does it continue. Uh, we got some good stuff to talk about today. Sekiro is out and has been uh, sort of grinding us down um, into a fine paste of our own shame, but has also taught us a lot about ourselves in the process. Uh, <laughs> Steven and I will be talking about how Sekiro is an analogy for uh, adult personal battles. <laughs> no, we're going to be talking about fucking rules is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we'll be talking about, Bo's going to be talking to us about Google's Stadia, which still sounds like an artificial sweetener to me, um, or something you get uh, disease-wise. Um, Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, cause, cause we had some brief hands on with, uh, that at GDC, we got to see it in action and we, it's sort of in action. We'll get into the, 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 the weeds with that. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, and we'll be talking about just GDC in general. There was some interesting news that came from the show. A surprisingly busy show in terms of news. Usually it's much more of a developer focused event and much more laid back, but, uh, this year was though. crazy. It was pretty wild. Pretty wild. It was a wild time, yeah. Yeah. Um, but let's start off with, uh, as we usually do, with our highlights of the week. Most of us were gone all week, so it was kind of hard to get that sweet, sweet game time in. You know what I'm saying? But um, James, are you not going to introduce us? Oh fuck me! I've been who I've been gone we? for a week. Uh, who are unbelievable? <laughs> who even am I if James? I doesn't feel me? so disrespected. I want to challenge you to a samurai duel right now. I parry your challenge. For my honor. Oh. Uh, and deliver a... No. Um, Stephen Messner, senior reporter, is with us. Hi. <laughs> Bo Moore, hardware lead. PC Gamer. Hello. That's Some me. Lovely people. Lovely people. I'm James Davenport. I'm an associate editor. Just a lowly associate editor. And your host of the show. Uh, yeah, let's talk about our highlights of the week. Um, Highlights of the week are where we kind of reflect on the last week in PC gaming and talk about anything that stood out to us from what we played or in the news or anything adjacent to our hobby. Um, why don't we start with uh, Bo? What, what, uh, what stood out to you? Uh, yeah, so I this week uh, in the post-GDC haze, yeah. I've been playing, I actually picked up a game. I've been playing it on Switch, but it's on PC as well, uh, called Moonlighter. It's like, um, I think it came out sometime last year. And... It's, it's one of those kind of Stardew Valley-esque type games, but you basically split your time between dungeon crawling and then managing a shop where you sell the stuff that you get in the dungeons. Mm. Uh, so pretty, it, it's pretty simple, not, not a lot of depth to it, uh, but I'm enjoying the, the last couple days of just kind of, it's got a nice, simple little gameplay loop of, you know, dive in, sell your stuff, Use that money to buy better gear. Go kill harder monsters. It's basic, but I'm I'm having fun. Right on. That's like very similar to Reketeer, right? Like you're half shop owner, half adventurer. I don't I don't know that one. Oh man, I feel like Reketeer was like what started that genre, and now there's all these other ones. But like it started that genre, and then maybe it didn't blow up big enough, and now other games have like eclipsed it you know how like people don't necessarily i feel like we're going to grow up in a generation where people don't know what harvest moon is <laughs> yeah like, they'll be like day, oh wow all these stardew valley likes it's yeah like, yeah oh. stardew valley clones are going to be like oh boy <laughs> the future is doomed like, uh, these, these old timey games that indie developers want to they were fans of when they were kids or whatever and now they're making them uh yeah uh, what was the advanced bolt wars uh Wargroove. Oh right, Wargroove. Yeah, uh, the, the Stardew Valley likes. Uh, excuse me, Harvest Moon likes. <laughs> it's already happening. Yeah, oh god, oh god. But uh, I welcome it. I welcome it. It's great. Um, people are saying now I'm really quiet. Sorry, I'm having some audio issues on my end. Why don't we uh, uh, move on to Steven's highlight while I try and fix that? Uh, sure. Yeah, my highlight was I mean, GDC is like a really busy time. Um, I. For you step counters out there, I was walking like sometimes 20,000 steps, which I think is like 10 miles a day. It was a lot of steps. Anyway, uh, so I got home and I was very tired. And the highlight of my week was just having two days to just sit on the sofa and do nothing except for stare at a screen. A good screen, not a bad screen, not a work screen. 
um and and just play video games and that's i played sekiro which we're going to be talking about later played a bit of the division i watched black hawk down on in a weird fit of wit of of i don't want i don't know why yeah. i watched black hawk down uh it's a good movie it is a good movie uh and people tell me if my voice is okay now it looks like it is the levels look okay ish but uh i'll, I'll adjust as we go um yeah, relaxing week. Just kind of noodling around. Didn't really have much time to play. I I, I feel you. Um, cool. Audio sounds good, according to Jules. Good to go. Yeah. yeah. That that bit of relaxing is definitely why I have been playing Moonlighter instead of continuing to play Apex. Because uh, I'm just like, I'm still super into Apex, but I'm like, I don't want to sit at my computer and like stress about yeah. aiming. I want to chill on the couch and lean back and like half pay attention to something. Yes. <laughs> so where my monitor, like my current desktop setup is like right next to our sofa. You can see it behind me actually. Oh, you can in this. Uh, but anyway, it's right behind me. And I actually like moved the lat or like the monitor, set it up on the coffee table. So it was like right next to the sofa, <laughs> right in front of the sofa and then laid down on the sofa. And that's how I played Hell games yeah. for 24 hours straight <laughs> nice. on the sofa. <laughs> I ordered takeout twice in one day. Uh, I was a real piece of <laughs> shitty garbage for, for the weekend, and it was lovely. I feel you. That's nice. my highlight. I feel you. Uh, yeah, my highlight just happened, I guess. Uh, there's a Borderlands trailer that came out. Um, pretty, I mean, like it hasn't been confirmed, but it's pretty much teasing Borderlands 3 at this point. The, all the signs are there. The, it makes sense. Uh, and there's going to be more revealed at PAX. But the teaser came out. And it's this, uh, gosh, it reminds me of that um, old Halo teaser where that like kind of looks yeah. through a, a battlefield of, of tiny figures. It's Except it zooms out to this face of one of those bandits. Uh, and there's a bunch of people I don't... <laughs> what stuck out to me about that trailer is like, I don't remember a fucking thing about Borderlands. I played hundreds of hours <laughs> of Borderlands. It was like my college game, our college hangout game. Uh, and what do I... like? Can you name a character? Handsome Jack. Clap yeah, trap. clap trap. Uh, 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 Tiny uh, Tina is that her name? Yeah, yeah that I feel was like one. there's a character named like Axiom or something. That sounds. Uh, it right. is honestly I, yeah shocking to me that you've played this. Subject before. Zero, I think, was a dude. I just found out. Like, can we rewind? We got to rewind. Okay. I just found out like an hour ago that you have played hundreds of hours of Borderlands Two, and I feel like I don't know who you are. I love Borderlands Two. It was it was uh, the one. It was like I mean, playing it. I mean, it's not like the best shooter at all. Like the feedback sucks. Uh, but at the time it was so novel to have like this big, fairly entertaining campaign to play with four people. I mean, the only other game that had done it was Halo, but with those loot systems built into it was, you know, it was the extra carrot on the stick and like all the guns were actually like really interesting, uh, especially at the time. So it was like this perfect, you know, after, I think it was before or after, but I don't know, Diablo three kind of like, didn't stick with us that well and borderlands and we didn't play it right when it came out but it became our thing and they kept supporting it with just expansion after expansion big and small and it was just it was yeah. just perfect for the time and i'm really really curious what the hell kind of shape borderlands 3 will take is it going to go all out and try and be like this destiny competitor or is it going to be like a more trimmed down just like another great you know, campaign with cool missions and just, you know, a light loot loop. It's going to be, if it does trim down or if it goes all out, I'm going to be so upset. That's the last thing I want on the planet is another fucking game that tries to be the one game that rules them all. (laughs) I know. Uh, I I really am hoping for a nice campaign. Yeah. Something you don't feel like. I play Borderlands too. So I like, I feel like by me saying, I don't know you, I'm implying that Borderlands is bad. It's a good game. I'm just, I never would have pegged you for a Borderlands, a Border Boy is what I a called BB? him in my, in my head can. One BBs. Of those BBs. Yeah, one of those Border Boys. I'm a BB. I'm a Border Boy. Um, I hear so much about them. <laughs> well, now with Borderlands 3, you can be a Border Man. <laughs> yeah. Border Man 3. <laughs> this Fuck is... you, Bo. I hate your puns, but I also think they're invaluable. Um, yeah, that's I my perform thing. a service. <laughs> Uh, let's hur- hurriedly move on from, uh, that, that terrible pun. Beautiful. Terrible yeah. Whatever, pun. whatever brings us closer to Sekiro. Anything. Is... Yeah. So we're, we're saving Sekiro for later in the show because I feel like if we do it early, we'll just talk the whole time. So we need to like have some kind of time limit. Um, let's move on to, uh, GDC overall. So 
A lot happened at GDC, Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. We all went down there as a team and, and covered it and uh, got to hang out, which was just a great time. But I'm going to run through some of, like, I think the, 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 the big, the big uh, headlines to come out of the show. And just give me your, give me your reactions. We're, we don't want to spend too much time on this so we can get to all the good stuff. But uh, this is also pretty surprising. I mean, like, fucking Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 was announced, and it's coming in 2020. How do we feel? How do we feel? Let me hear it. Are you excited? Uh, uh, yeah, no. sure. I like sucking blood. Do you now? <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I never played the first I'm one. Blood or boy. I don't know anything about that series. So none of us. We have some people on staff. It kind of means staff. nothing to me, but I. Yeah. There are people. Yeah, like you said, there were people on staff who were really hyped about it. So yeah. I was like, all right, cool. Joanna like was losing her mind, and and uh, she's going to be our go-to, I think, for this series in general. Um, she, God bless her. I learned so much lore. I about know. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> like, looking forward to the primary. I now know what out. thin bloods are. Yeah. I know what Malkavians are. I know everything about that game. And Just honestly, like read, like hanging out with Joanna. Yeah, yeah, hearing her talk about it, it like it sold me on going back and checking it out. So I think there's this deal still going on. Um, you can get the original game on GOG for like five bucks, and it comes with like all these mods pre-installed that basically fix the game, make it much more playable. Um, all right. So nice. check that out. Uh, just a couple more tidbits related to that. It's going to have support's going to support ray tracing, DLSS, and whatever mods, mod support, which is very, very exciting. Uh, also, Chris uh, Avalone and Kara Ellison are writing on it, which is very exciting to me. Um, so yeah, more, more, more blood time. Can you guys hear my cat yelling at the door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll go. I'm... Mod support doesn't surprise me because I mean, how how else are people gonna fix the game when they when it inevitably releases as a buggy, broken mess like the first one? <laughs> huh? Huh? Yeah. That was it. That was my dig. I missed it because I was opening the door for my cat. But I'm sure it was really that's fine. really good, Stephen. It was. It was. It was a good one. Okay. It was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> well, I'll have to listen back to it and uh, judge you after the fact. Yeah. Um, Epic had a lot to say about their store, and I'm not gonna read off every headline. But there was a lot. There was a lot. Uh, some more exclusives were announced, some s s timed ones, and some surprise exclusives. I think uh, The Outer Worlds, which is Obsidian's new uh, first-person RPG, is going to launch on the Epic Store. Um, that set, set Reddit on fire. Uh, uh, Control, Remedy's new strange uh, like Twilight Zone-looking shooter, will launch on the Epic Store, along with some other games like The Sinking City, After Party, and... Industries of Titan, which if you don't know what Indus Industries of Titan is, it's it's from the developers of Crypt of the Necrodancers. It's really fascinating, like mix of FTL and like sort of a ship builder. It's it's wild. Um, so all those are going to be launching on the Epic Store, and I mean it, it really felt like Epic came out as if they already hadn't like laid a few direct blows on Steam. This is like holy shit, they're they're not fucking around. Uh, they really want to be a go to destination. Um, even if their feature set isn't there yet. Uh, how are you guys feeling about all these exclusives? Oh, almost forgot. Quantic Dream games are coming. Like, uh, yeah. fucking... <laughs> uh, Heavy Rain. Heavy Rain, <laughs> Detroit Become Human, and Beyond Two Souls. Almost all of which are pretty bad. But uh, it, it, at the very least, we get to write things about them now. Um, so, thoughts? You guys, you, guys, you guys mad? You get upset? You don't give a shit? What's, what's the take here? kind of don't care yeah. like you know yeah I, I i it's annoying <laughs> that i have to you know download a different launcher and that my friends list doesn't transfer over but like so i'll just get new friends <laughs> <laughs> well they're all single player games so you yeah, yeah that to, too i don't really don't care have to worry about that yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I already have the Epic Launcher installed. What's one more? I already have Uplay, Origin, GOG, Steam, all the secondary ones I need for dumb MMOs or any other games. It's like, ah, just throw one more in the bunch. What a not a big deal. If it means developers are making a better cut and that turn in turn means better profit for them or you know, like a more sustainable working environment, and um, then I'm happy for that and I'm happy to support that. I don't really care where I buy a video game from though, personally. Yeah, we'll have uh, our Q and A up today, which I think is it today addresses kind of our yeah. editorial. Well, maybe not our, our holistic editorial like uh, take on it, but everyone 
sort of contributed their take to it and you kind of read what we th we think about it and the consensus seems to be that uh it really doesn't matter that much um exclusives and sort of the this, this is this is capitalism at work baby <laughs> i'm sorry uh yeah but, yeah <laughs> like you can't get mad when a company uses its money to do company things to make more money business um, yeah like it's maybe not I don't know. friendly for us the consume we the consumers but uh it really is not a terrible inconvenience overall but uh feel free to email me about how mad you are about my personal opinion um but Epic did say also at the show that they will stop eventually pushing for exclusives. So this is like a this is a very very much their initial uh, uh, attempt, like a very strong attempt, while they have that Fortnite money to you know make a name for themselves and, and get out yeah. there. Um, it's a lot more. They also, sorry, go for it. Oh, I was just gonna say they also said that uh, they won't be repeating what they did with Metro Exodus. Yeah. So if you're buying something on Steam. I mean, there's been a few games that have had Steam pages, like very early, early Steam pages. Yeah. Like I think um, Outer Worlds, I think originally had a Steam page and then they switched over to the Epic Store. But uh, like, you're not gonna have this thing. They're not looking to repeat this thing where it's like two weeks until this game launches, you've already pre-purchased it on Steam and surprise, nope, you need to now get it on this Epic Store instead. They don't wanna repeat that, yeah. which to be fair was really stupid. With Metro, it was, it was kind gross. of a, that was really kind of shitty. Uh, yeah in my opinion yeah um but anyway i'm just trying to think what's best for developers uh, that also yeah. doesn't corner me uh in other news steam is getting a redesigned <gasps> library uh did you guys Shut take a look up. at that finally and <laughs> yeah they, they they put up some images i'll link to it in chat uh it doesn't look too revolutionary to me but it it does look nice and it looks like so this is this is the library not the store page not the store page just the library and it's long overdue the library right now is just a i, I everyone has hundreds of games now because every, i think humble bundles and just the the nature of these right. sales means the library is like unmanageable uh, after a certain point for most people so it looks nice so here's a hot tip I don't know if you yeah. guys do this. I feel like I'm cutting you off all the time. No, James, no, I'm, so I'm just trying to run through these, but I want to hear what you guys might <laughs> okay. think for sure. I'm just going to say this real quick. If you're feeling like the Steam library is super unmanageable, just go. I did this a while ago, and I was like, oh, my God, it changed my life. I just went and changed it so it only, instead of showing games, you just click on the search bar, and you just change it to installed, and then it only shows you the games that you actively have installed. So unless you're like looking to play something new, then obviously yeah. you got to go trudging through your entire library. But now I have like four games in my library, which is it, it helps fight off that that awful like paralysis you get when you're like I, I want to play something and I there's a bajillion games. Anyway, sorry. There are some third party this. tools like that help you like automatically that like pull from uh, uh, like tag sets online that folks have made and automatically tag your game so you can sort by that and, and but you know it's hopefully the sorting tools and and the visual update will make it just much easier to navigate i'm it's about damn time uh, they're also adding an events page and th this is sort of not not like it, steam already has events an event system but this is focused on displaying upcoming events for games as a response to the surge of sort of games as a service so Rather than like, oh, PC Gamer's hosting a, a TF2 uh, two-fort match uh, today. It's, go it's going to be like focused on the actual services and sort of more um, developer-created uh, events, which is cool because I think that's like a, a new emerging thing. Like it's hard to keep track of uh when rainbow six siege got you know an update and new operators um right at the same time the division two well shit that's not a steam <laughs> for example something like the division two <laughs> on steam, you know uh just a, a place to look glance and kind of see what's going on in monster hunter world and juggle all that information is cool right that's neat to me that uh, is a cool feature but those, those are like some of the bigger headlines am i missing anything to you guys well we'll talk about stadia uh at length here um but that's what kind of jumped out to me is like the big epic stuff and and some steam updates and uh vampire obviously um but i want to know what did you guys take from the show what was your sort of favorite thing uh that you saw or heard or witnessed over the week let me tell you about this game <laughs> here we go this game is the cat game the cat it game. was great 
It's a game called Calico. I played it at the uh, at one of the, the indie game showcase things that we went to. Uh, it's super early. It's it's a long way from release. Still very buggy. Uh, not a lot to it right now. But the bit that I played was awesome. the The premise is you are magical girls running a cat cafe. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I think I'm looking at a trailer in chat, or excuse me, uh, of the game you're talking about. And yeah, it says, it's pretty great. You you run a cat cafe. You can build it however you like. You can put all sorts of toys and stuff for the cats to hang out in. You can go to like a witch's shop and buy a potion to give to a cat that makes the cat big, and then you can ride the cat. I'm going to put this on screen because I have to. Yeah. This looks amazing. Holy it's... shit. <laughs> There was one point where I was wandering through the forest and there was like a tree with a bunch of cats sort of circling around the tree. And I picked up one of those cats and then the circle of cats started following me around and I basically just recruited my own cat cult. It was great. I'm watching the animation of this cat galloping while you ride it and you can jump. It's just it's just got this really lovely vibe to it. It's like it's a- yeah, it's super joyous. Like it's just about hanging out with cats and having fun and doing whatever your heart desires. Right. Uh it's yeah, like I said, still a long, long way from release, probably, you know, 2020 or later. Mm-hmm. Uh but I am very much looking forward to hanging out with these cats. Hot damn. That okay, and that's called Calico. Calico, uh, yeah. So go go check it out. Uh, have they done a Kickstarter or anything yet? Do you know? Is it? Is that I think I think they're planning to do a Kickstarter. Okay. Uh, they may have done one um, that didn't really get much traction, but like they can't have come back with like a, a better, like made a little more progress, got their vision together a little bit more. And mm-hmm. if I recall, I believe they're going to do do another one uh, in the next couple months, probably. So right on. that looks amazing. Hopefully that goes well, and I'm, I'm yeah, I'm really psyched for it. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, Steven. What's your kind of highlight from uh, the old GDC? Oh, man, it was tough. I mean, we already kind of touched on some of the big stuff. Uh, for me, it was like a really interesting GDC because it was just a lot of doing like interviews and boots on the ground, like shaking hands with developers. And so like it was just it was really cool to like sit down and go to some of the panels. Um, I learned a lot of interesting things like uh, I love this one panel that talked about how the, all of Assassin's Creed's uh, Odyssey's dialogue cutscenes were procedurally generated really? and how they like, oh. yeah. So they had, to, I won't go so far into it, but like, you know, they had to do that, that game was vastly more story heavy than any Assassin's Creed they'd done before. Yeah. He said this one had about 30 hours of cutscenes, whereas previous Assassin's Creed's maybe had about three. So that was an, an enormous sort of like over or challenge that they had to sort of find a way to do it. And so they basically developed like a procedural cutscene generation system where they could say like, all right, we need to have these two actors. They're standing like this and it would just like randomly generate like uh like sort of their their body language as they're talking and the camera was like a smart camera that would automatically like set the scene and so they basically could generate these scenes using a computer and then cinematic designers would go in and just tweak them to actually make them look good or adjust them as they needed it but like Mm -hmm. the brunt of the work was actually just being handled by procedural generation and that actually was like a theme with a lot of the things i saw this week which is like developers you do when you think procedural generation i think a lot of people like my mind it used to always just shoot to no man's sky which is like oh, i just we made a universe out of math and uh now it's now i feel like there's far more nuanced uses for it it's cool to see the way that it's enabling games to become uh or developers to work smarter not harder and so yeah. it allows them to make yeah. like assassin's creed odyssey is this amazing enormous game where the world is so detailed and you know it's just it's crazy to think that a studio was able well several studios were able to create that um but i guess it, you know part of the reason they were able to do that is because they were able to offload some of that sort of creative endeavor just onto machines and so that's cool that it's cool. it's like taking the idea of automation and like applying it to development where you take if you have to do a task multiple times but it, that that like results in a similar thing but you got to do it a bunch of times like figure out a way to automate that and then go in and yeah. make it still look human yeah, so it, it was really interesting. So I don't have like one specific highlight out of GDC. Right. It was just seeing a lot of cool stuff, like just getting to talk to people and, you know, hopefully some of this stuff will start to make its way into stories right over the next month. So right on. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, 
good to, good to hear. Uh, for me, my highlight was uh, getting extremely drunk and sneaking off to find a mission burrito. At, like, I thought you died. One in the morning. <laughs> I, I kind of like was, yeah, I felt a little bad uh, uh, once I got there and realized what I was doing. I had the very, a very lucid moment. I was like, oh, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. And I'm just kind of wandering around <laughs> at night uh, and just yep. sitting there with like the next day or excuse me, when I got home, I looked at my jacket and my partner was like, what did you get all over yourself? And I was like, oh, this, this some burrito. Le- There's just a half eaten burrito mashed into your pocket. <laughs> didn't you, that's how I like, forgot I had it. By the end of the week, yeah. I was just like, oh, I didn't even fucking notice I got burrito all over me. But besides that, I mean, like, there is, uh, I saw some pretty cool games. Um, got to play around with Splunky 2 and co-op, which is great. I, you know, I really need to spend more time with it. It feels like Splunky. Uh, I played a game called Void Bastards, which is like a an 80s a grimy 80s comic take on like a an ftl system shock mashup uh but what really stuck out to me is another stupid mashup and tell me if you've heard about this game uh atomic crops i'll put on the trailer for everyone here um because the trailer's delightful it's got this lovely like uh grimy cartoon look to it um and uh i i can just imagine this guy I, I can't remember the name of the developers, excuse me, but the, the pitch being this simple is just like enter the Gungeon plus uh, Stardew Valley. <laughs> um, that made me laugh. Yeah, and and it's literally that. It's like a it's a top down um, uh, shmup, basically, a uh, bullet hell shooter, uh, where <laughs> that that injects like sort of the cadence of a of a farming sim. So you're multitasking. You are, uh, uh, you'll start like the the game operates in in day day cycles. So you'll start off and like you press a button to like dig up some holes and um, and you find seeds by like wandering north, south, east, or west to these different biomes that make up this overworld. And you like kill enemies sometimes to like get certain seeds, or you can harvest them from different plants and such. And then you bring them back and like slowly expand this um, this farm of yours. And uh, all the while, like later on in the day, enemies will start coming to, like to harass you, uh, including like slugs who gun for your plants and and uh, other enemies that just try to gun for you and kill you. All the while, you're like juggling, heading to the well for water to make sure your plants grow. Um, uh, you're trying to harvest them, so you have to like continually like water them. Uh, and and then harvest them before the night is up, and a helicopter comes in and takes you to town, where you can like buy sort of those those enter the gungeon mods um, that give you like new weapons or or weird uh, harvesting tools or farming tools with wacky stats that I'm sure like uh, Binding of Isaac style will have uses I can't even uh, fathom yet. Um, you can also <laughs> I love the romance system because. During the day, you have to plant and harvest roses that you throw at people when you get back to uh, the main base. And, like, depending on who you romance, gives you certain, like, um, sidekicks or, or buffs or advantages based on – or during the day. It's, like, this really goofy, goofy take that, like, sounds like it shouldn't work. It sounds so dumb that it should just be, like – it's, like, a gimmick. You know, like, ha, ha, ha. But it actually, like, the cadence of it and, and the juggling, um, juggling, like, the farming and bullet hell shit is – very very uh entertaining the art is also amazing i don't know like it, it might be divisive to some people but then uh toby toby shit i forget his last name uh maybe toby fox or is that the undertale guy but um toby undertale. fox is undertale yeah i'm forgetting his name toby dixon uh he did the art for uh nidhogg 2 so it's this grimy like almost like 90s nickelodeon style looking uh stuff that i really really love um that's atomic crops that looks amazing. incredible i'll be writing it up i love sure. it I love that the tagline for that is farm, marry, kill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super silly, oh, but man. feels great to play. So, you know, you blew it, my mind. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty that good. That is a good pitch. Very good pitch. Very good pitch. Uh, but let's, let's move on to like sort of the, I think like one of the, the bigger topics uh, and announcements at, um, oh God, I just fucked up our little nub. Um, at uh, GDC was Google Stadia. And, and Bo, break yeah. it down for us. What the hell is Google Stadia? Is it pronounced uh, Stadia? <laughs> no, it's Stadia. Oh, uh, okay. Steve, what are you doing? Uh, Get out. I'm just 
Get out. Okay. <laughs> Get out. Uh, yeah, Google Stadia. It's a so basically it's a it's a game streaming service. Um, if you if you played so like back in I think it was October or so, yeah. uh, Google did a, a, something called Project Stream, which they later revealed was basically just the the public beta test without telling one anyone of stadia so the idea is uh along the same lines as on live at video geforce now uh playstation now i think it's called the, these other cloud game streaming services um instead of you know installing a game on your local machine and playing it off your local hardware the game is run on servers in a data center somewhere and then they just stream that game to you uh, and so basically like a lot of companies have kind of tried this over the past five plus years mm -hmm. Some have worked, none have really taken off. The closest so far has been NVIDIA with GeForce Now, which I think is in like a, a beta-ish form right now, which it does work. Uh, and, and Joanna had a big test of it uh, that went up pretty recently. She tested it on like high school internet with a classroom full of kids um, and it, it worked pretty well. Um, but yeah, so Stadia though is, is Google's take on this game streaming idea uh the the big benefit that google has going for it is they have a lot of experience with data and mm -hmm. they have massive massive data centers so basically they have the back-end hardware to kind of make this happen on a pretty large scale the other thing that they have is youtube and the idea with stadia is that it's going to be integrated pretty seamlessly with youtube what what they kind of want to happen is uh Again, previously with with things like GeForce Now, you would typically like you would still buy the game yourself, and then you would like go you would like log into GeForce Now, and then like it would validate your Steam account, and it would show you like okay, you have these games available, these games are available on GeForce Now, and then then you can stream them. Um, with Stadia, it's you're, you're, we don't we don't know anything about pricing or, or how this will work, but the way that they demoed it was you can just be like watching a YouTube video, watching a trailer, maybe you're watching a Let's Play, um, uh, somebody streaming on YouTube Live, whatever their streaming thing is called, um, and then there there could be a link there, and instead of being like link to buy this game and it takes you to a store page or the game's website or whatever, uh, you would just click that link and it would just open that game in browser and you could just be playing in a matter of seconds. Neato. Which sounds really cool. Like that sounds awesome. Uh, not only that, like that you can it, it may be that you you depending on what that link that was shared was you might start it right at the beginning of the game or like a streamer for example could could literally share like this is where i'm at right now and then like their instance of the their copy of the game instance is like copied and then you could basically pick up right from where they are um mm -hmm. same thing with if you can you share gameplay clip like sharing a, a thing with your friends instead of you know recording a video or a gif or something you could literally just share like here's this bit that I just played through, like play it yourself. All oh, this sounds really cool. Yes. There's two, two main problems with Stadia. One uh, is we have no idea how, how much it's going to cost, what it, you know, basically that the cost uh, yeah. it, it could be, it might be a subscription service where you have to, you know, pay a monthly fee along the same lines as Netflix or Spotify or whatever, where you just have a, you know, a Stadia subscription. Uh, it could be that there's no subscription, but instead you, um, you know, when you click that link, you also have to say like, okay, I want to buy Assassin's Creed Odyssey through Stadia. And then you have that. Um, if it's that way, kind of whatever way it is, it's almost certain, although we don't know for sure that like, having it on stadia does not mean you also have a local copy so you're pretty much if you're going to be playing it on stadia you're like committing to playing it on stadia mm -hmm. um that means you could play it on stadia on your desktop pc but really you're just playing it on like a chrome browser on your desktop pc you're not right. using your local hardware um Oh yeah, the other thing that I mentioned is not only can you just it's you stream it, uh, it, it can stream to pretty much anything that has 
a Chrome browser. So that means, you know, a, yes, a regular desktop PC, but also a TV with Chromecast, uh, a Chromebook, you know, a super lightweight laptop with, with little to no hardware processing power on it, phones, tablets, pretty much anything. If, right. if it can run Chrome, you can stream Engage. to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, can the Engage run Chrome? I don't know. But if so, <laughs> Check, yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, so again, that, that all seems really cool. And, and they definitely played up the idea of, you know, you could be playing it at home on the couch, but then you gotta, you gotta go. And so you just like suspend your game state. And then when you pick it up on your phone on the train or something, you're like right there at that same spot where you were. Again, sounds really cool. We don't know what it's going to cost. It might be also like a, a pay per minute type thing. Uh, some some game streaming services have tried that, where you Barf. you either you either have a subscription fee or you kind of pay you know literally pay by the minute. Maybe it's that. Um, so yeah, those are all unanswered questions. The other main problem with Stadia is latency. Uh, and this has always been a problem with game streaming services, um, with things like again GeForce Now and the and its contemporaries beforehand. The latency problem has gotten better for sure over the years, uh, and in a lot of cases, yeah, it's it's not really noticeable. The and, and that's the thing where Google coming into play, they have that data center power to to back this up. They have. They can do the processing. They can make games look very, very good on their end and stream that to you. They, they say at launch, and launch is sometime in 2019, uh, they say at launch, you'll be able to stream in 4K, 60 FPS, uh, scaling back to like 1080p, 60, or even 720, 60 if you have a crappy internet connection. But even, even with a crappy internet connection, you should be able to stream without many problems. Um, and and for that reason, they they started with one of the first games that they developed for Stadia was Doom, uh, Doom 2016, mm -hmm. and the upcoming Doom Eternal. But they they were like, can we put this game on Stadia? Uh, it being Doom 2016, um, and they wanted to do that because they were like, Doom is a fast paced first person shooter. It's a you know Twitch based shooter. You if we can't you know latency is a really big thing in a game like this and if we can't get it right for doom you know we can't get it right like it, that's the bar that we want to try and hit did they hit that i don't really know yet uh i did play i got to test stadia at gdc um the version i was testing was like it was running on a dev kit with some simulated latency or something i don't know it, it was kind of hard to tell Basically, the question all is going to come down to your internet connection. Yeah. Um, but the main thing for me, at least in terms of what I played in Doom, the latency was for sure noticeable. Uh, you like uh, the best example I can give is Jared, our intrepid hardware uh, reviewer who does tons of benchmarks. He bent Doom is one of the games that he benchmarks systems on and, and graphics cards on. And for his test sequence, he runs through the first like tutorial level of Doom. He, he, and he runs the same path, and he's run this path like hundreds of times, mm -hmm. like hundreds of times. He never, never dies. He, well, the first time he played it on Stadia, he died like five times Oof. because he kept missing his shots. And yeah, it, like th that. And and when I played it, also like. I didn't die immediately. So I will say when he when he died several times, that was on a simulated latency right. version, which uh, so we don't that they were saying that it's like a what it would be what it would be playing like on a bad internet connection. So that was adding like eighty to a hundred plus milliseconds of lag on top of like just regular game lag or whatever. Um and yeah, so like that was it on the bad one. I also we we tested it again, slightly less uh, simulated, but but not the like perfect top of the line internet. They weren't showing that off at the time, mm. um, or, or we didn't get to see it at least. Uh, and yeah, the, the the slightly better version. Like I didn't die, but I still like for sure missed a lot of shots. I, I didn't 
I was I was overshooting or like you know I would move my mouse and it, I would hit the shots, but I, I kind of had to like mentally adjust to like oh this is how my shots are going to hit, so I have to compensate myself. Um, we did also test Assassin's Creed Odyssey on it, and on that like you can hardly lo- notice the latency at all. Like it's right. it's barely there, and and the reason mainly for that is because in a game like Assassin's Creed. Uh, that game has a lot of very flowy animation that cover up latency. Like, yes. you know, when, when you tilt the control stick, your, your, your guy, you know, moves a little bit. And, and like when you press the button, like there's this big flowy, you know, sword animation. It's not the same as like moving a mouse a tiny bit and like pulling the trigger and having it fire off immediately. Uh, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. long story short, the, I think Stadia will be totally playable on even pretty bad internet if you're playing anything that has either that has animations like that that can cover up the latency or games that like where latency doesn't matter at all if you're playing, you know, something turn based or tactics or, you know, anything like that. But if you're playing, you know, something real time, especially with a lot of uh, really, you know, where those fine, delicate movements matter. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's noticeable, at least it was in the bit that I played. Having said that, you know, it's still, it's still not launching yet. Uh, they're still working on it. And again, like your internet quality plays a lot into this. So with, you know, a gigabit connection or, you know, a hundred megabit connection or something, maybe it won't be noticeable on, on something like doom, but the bits that we played, it definitely was. Yeah, what what stands out to me is like all this sounds and I, all this sounds like good in theory, but I just the question I have is who who is this for? And and maybe my perspective is skewed because like I'm a hardcore gamer guy with a computer that costs way too much in his room and and the idea of having this kind of middling like inherently lesser experience, maybe not by much um that requires like crazy, pretty, pretty darn good internet that like a, a certain income bracket is, is the only, you know, uh, the kind of people who will be aff- able to afford this and play this kind of stuff. Theoretically, maybe, you know, they account for some, some lower bandwidth and that'll be impressive and cool if that's the case. But it's just, I, I just can't quite pinpoint the use case for this uh, on a, on a wide, like on a massive scale. Uh, uh, totally. especially you know, the infrastructure of uh, broadband in America specifically and, and the greater world as a whole. It's just kind of, I don't know, it doesn't quite fit to me. I don't know, do you guys have similar anxieties? I think or? like, yeah, yeah. I, I think another one too is like, okay, average, if we're looking at sort of like the average person who's not already a gamer yeah. or has sort of like limited capabilities, I feel like those people also fall under this umbrella that like the vast majority of like home Wi-Fi setups are shit. Uh, and it's because people don't know how to set up Wi-Fi, and it's because it's a very complicated process, and you hire someone who comes to your house from Comcast or whatever, and they do it for you, but they don't really know what they're doing either, and so they put the router in the basement up against two walls. And, and then they, just... they sell you a shitty, shitty router. Yeah, and you get like a really bad router, like an awful router. Yeah. Um, and then you just think, that's my internet now that I pay $100 for. And so like... I think that's also going to be another hurdle, which is yeah. people, like, even if everything works all the way to your house as soon as it gets into the house i feel like that's this other obstacle that google's gonna have to find some way to like overcome they're gonna have to start doing like weird education initiatives being like yeah. how, to, how to make your wi-fi better yeah uh, i mean the the thing that i will say is like two things one uh to the to the point of like getting people or, or when, when when the developers are developing for stadia like there is a section or a tool within the developer tools that lets them simulate latency so like they can experience what it is like playing the game that they are actively developing on a variety of different latency yeah. you know a variety of different internet connections so like they're not purely going to be developing only for the best and then people with crappy internet just get shafted like the mm-hmm. idea is that they make it good enough for those those lower internet sections right. the other thing i'll say is like yes this is early like it, it's kind of i don't want to call it a moonshot type 
project, but it is a, it's Google is sort of just laying it down and getting it out there so that when internet kind of catches up, it'll, it's already in place because, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the comparison that I like to think about is think about, um, streaming video and even before that streaming audio like right. in the early days of the internet you couldn't stream like anything if you wanted to listen to a song hell even to like look at a picture mm-hmm. you had to download that picture right. you couldn't just like have it there on the screen uh and then then it you know audio was the next step up of, of like you know the file sizes were significantly larger than picture sizes and so if you wanted to to listen to a song, you had to go to somewhere like, you know, Napster or Kazaa or whatever and download these songs to your device or, you know, obviously more uh, legitimate sources like iTunes. <laughs> um, but still, you had to you had to download these files and put the digital file on your device and then listen to it locally. Uh, and then same thing with video, like if you wanted to watch a video, you had to download the file or you like put the physical DVD in your drive or you downloaded the digital copy of that movie and you watched it that way. But then YouTube came along and Spotify came along and like now you can stream a movie in 4K without having to say, let me, you know, compare Netflix now to trying to watch like a flash video in, you know, 20 years ago where you had to load up the video and let it sit there and buffer for a few minutes before you could, you know, stream it. And now we can just stream a 4k video, a 4k movie without any problems. Yeah. So it, basically the internet will catch up. It it might be there for some people now. It definitely is not there for a lot of people, but it might get there. Right. And it, and it will get there eventually. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm apprehensive and, yeah. and cautious, but uh, for broader reasons, too. I mean, we don't have to spend, we shouldn't really move on, but, you know, do we want to get, like, di- disown our, our, our games even further? You know, we already only own, like, licenses to play games on these, these platforms. Do we want to then not even have the data on? on our, our PCs. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a weird, yeah. it's a weird. There's time. a whole, whole lot of other questions there. The <laughs> other big one for me is, is, and I don't want to go too much into it so we can move on, but like getting into the developer side of things, yeah. uh, you know, how are developers going to get paid for these games that they're making? Or, you know, is, is Google going to cut them a check to put their game on Stadia or developer game for Stadia? Or are they going to, they going to be paid per you know, paid per download or paid per minute of gameplay. Like Spotify was not kind to indie artists. No. Like they don't make hard. They make next to nothing fractions of a fractions of fractions of a fraction of a cent per stream of a song. But, you know, some, some will argue that there's a, a net positive for indie artists because their music gets exposed and then they can make money through ticket sales and merch and things like that. But like, you know, games don't go on tour that I can buy tickets for to like support my favorite developer mm. after I streamed their game via Stadia. Um, so it's it's gonna be a wild, wild next decade or so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not I'm not saying that all these problems are, like gonna crop up overnight, but these are things that we're gonna have to grapple with in the next five, ten, twenty years. Yeah, yeah. In tandem with all these games as a service and these new ways developers are trying to like keep people playing their games and and keep making money from them. And now we have new methods of playing that kind of feed into that. I don't know. My brain hurts thinking about it. So I'm going to go ahead and deflect Perry deflect, uh, this topic and, and, uh, uh, initiate a Shinobi death blow into the next segment. Is it, yeah, yeah, you did. You did it. Let's talk about that segue was about as good as I am at Sekiro. (laughs) Okay, so really good. You're, you're yeah, so good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sekiro, uh, it's Sekiro Shadows Die Twice from Software's uh, newest game and and like first major departure from the the Souls formula. There's a lot of Souls stuff there, but this is I think 
for me, at least uh, from from my perspective, is not a Souls game. Um, and it's been interesting to see it's uh, people, you know, the, the first couple days with it and sort of the, the arc uh, of, of this is extremely hard, it's the hardest game yet, to oh my god, it's clicking, to this is the best thing I've ever seen. Um, but first of all, I, I want to, before we get into sort of our personal arcs and relationships with Sekiro and uh, the whiplash we felt, um, I want to know. Oh, you haven't been playing, so I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, but feel I'm free just to sit here, so. <laughs> interject at any point. Uh, Steven, like, give it, give give me your impressions so far of of this uh, the sword game. Oh boy, it was uh, it was touch and go for a while, James. Yeah, yeah, it was. There was there was a period where I, I was pretty sure I didn't like Sekiro, and was like almost a bit sad because I was like feeling like I was discovering that it was just not good mm-hmm. <laughs> or like there wasn't it like Dark Souls it's tough but like Dark Souls from software games I always like have these moments that just wow you yeah uh, whether it's like an incredible vista or an amazing boss enemy or something something so crazy and because Kiro is set in sort of a like low fantasy historical version of ancient Japan um it's a little bit lighter it's not as heavy-handed on like the the fantasy elements I mean there's still like mountain castles but there's not like crystalline mountain castles <laughs> hey you know there I mean? is a there is a guy who screams at you as he flies from so <laughs> and that's all i need to survive these <laughs> days but like that that's what i'm that's my point though is like it doesn't have those things and so at first i was kind of like oh man this isn't like as as dramatic as from software's other games but now as i've started to get into it i've started to appreciate its subtleties mm-hmm. and uh the things that it does and i think it might like a, a week ago or not a week ago it hasn't even been out a week Earlier in the week, I feel like James and I were talking, and I was like, it's good, but it's definitely the worst From Software game ever <laughs> they've made yeah. uh, in sort of this Soulsborne series that people talk about. But like every day that I've played, it's like slowly like gone higher and higher mm-hmm. and higher up the list. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it's going to sit in the grand scheme of things, but I think this might be probably, it's easily hands down my favorite combat system oh, of, for sure. of any of their games Easily. i don't know in the grand scheme of things i'm getting to areas now that are wacky and weird and very cool um i had to fight four monkeys um <laughs> the monkey. do you know what i'm talking about james i'll try and avoid spoilers yeah do you know what i'm yeah. talking about uh I, yeah like, i think so i think so it's a it's a toughie <laughs> The, the the hear no evil see no evil speak no evil monkeys <laughs> okay 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 yeah so, i'll yeah, say yeah. no more i'll say no more no spoilers, no spoilers. Uh, yeah. But anyway, no, I'm loving it. I, I think it's like, it's so good. It is everything you love about these games, uh, but subversive and refined. And like, it's just so different, but so similar at the same time. Mm-hmm. The story is really good. The lore is really good. I'm starting to really appreciate the characters and sort of the relationships with one another. Like, there's a lot there. Yeah, I was worried about the, uh, the more story forward uh, direction from his taking with uh, Sekiro and because I, I in the Souls games I, I love sort of the hands off you get a you get uh, some vague uh, information from your item descriptions and you get these mysterious NPCs that kind of speak in almost like riddles uh, and yeah. there's, there's plenty of that in here but you also I don't know like there, there is a central conflict tied to a point in history that and it helps to have a little understanding, not like you don't really need to be an expert on the Sengoku era uh, of, uh, in Japan, but it, it helps to have some color uh, and understanding of that because this is really just about um, about war for me and, and sort of yeah. like how violence and conflict radiates out and affects these the central cast of characters. Um, and then, you know, then they take that and sort of run with it uh, as this wild analogy for all these fantastic things you you see in the game um injecting a lot of cool japanese folklore and such but uh (laughs) i think like a key difference is like dark souls one two and three and then bloodborne as well like they were all set in in these areas these kingdoms for lack of a better word that had fallen thousands of years ago or countless years ago like every single one of those games and bloodborne was a bit more recent but it was still like these were like post-apocalyptic games in in a in a sense Mm -hmm. uh and this is like 
Sekiro is like almost pre-apocalyptic. Like mm-hmm. the the death blow to Ashina, the kingdom that you, the whole game is set in, hasn't happened yet. Everyone's like mm-hmm. waiting for the sword to fall, and then this story is taking place within it. So the the reason why I bring that up and what sort of different about the lore is like in Dark Souls, you're learning about these characters that don't exist anymore. Or I mean, some of them are still alive, yes. but like a lot of them don't exist anymore. And they're like mythological characters. Yeah, like yeah. you're learning the mythology of, of Lordran or whatever. Um, whereas this, like there's not really much of that at all. It's a lot of like, nope, this guy's <laughs> he was just over here like a week ago saying hi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he's still around. But I, I'm really pre- like I'm really enjoying the differences now. I'm you know I feel like my palate has adjusted, and now I'm I'm able to savor mm, all the juicy little bits. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And and early on, I think that I mean we we put up a story, well several stories on the site this week that sort of address the difficulty and people's different experiences with those first like ten hours or so. Um, but yeah, th- those first ten hours are 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 sort of inconsistent, or at least like if you've played a Souls game, um, or one or two of them before then you you are kind of going in at a disadvantage and you you spoke to this in, in this piece you wrote i'll link to in chat about sort of when you when it clicked for you and how it yeah. clicked for you and i, I kind of want to know without again without doesn't require any spoiling just so you, everyone listening knows we're not going to talk about specifics here when and why and how specifically did uh, Sekiro click for you steven yeah, so, okay, like, I will say this, like, as much as I'm adoring this game now, I yeah. do think that, like, uh, objectively, I, I hate that word, but, like, this is the worst intro in all of From Software's games. Yeah. Um, I think there's some really bad encounter design early on that exacerbates the problem of already having to learn this incredibly difficult game with really punishing combat. And now, like, if I went back and had to do those encounters again and my character's all powered up, I have a bunch more items, um, and I just understand the combat way more, I think I would do a far better job of it. But as, like, this fledgling shinobi newbie, uh, it was incredibly painful for me. And it was really easy to fall back in sort of those old habits that I had from Dark Souls, which was to be very passive, to sort of keep my guard up at all times, wait for an opening, and then try and strike. And I went through that for about 15 hours, and I was basically able to cheese bosses. One of the things is because it has stealth. Mm-hmm. Um, Sekiro's, uh, you know, a, kind of a partial stealth game, and the arenas that you're kind of fighting in are very open and sort of non-linear. It's very easy, and in some ways, like expected, that what you're going to do is like if you're fighting a boss, the first thing you're going to do is actually do a shinobi death blow on them, which is eliminates half of their health yeah. right off the gate, and then you'll fight through sort of their second health bar, um, and that's sort of like an expected thing that you'll do. So anyway. Um, the point I was trying to make was I totally forgot. Oh my God. <laughs> when did it click uh, for you? <laughs> <laughs> when did it click for me? So I'm going through these arenas and, uh, oh my God, I totally forgot the point I was going to make. Anyway, I'm, I'm fighting through this combat system. I don't understand it all the way. And these arenas are really challenging. It's hard to navigate them. And uh, the stealth isn't great. Like it, 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 it's very wonky. Enemies can see you. And so it was just building up to all these frustrations. But then I finally hit this moment. Oh, I remember what I was saying. So like... I had fallen back on sort of my old Dark Souls instincts. And the problem with Sekiro is not Dark Souls. It yeah. it has a very similar combat system. It has a very, I mean, obviously the games, the way you explore the world and everything like that is very reminiscent of Dark Souls. But like the combat actually couldn't be more different. Yeah. Um, and so I had been able to basically, I, the reason I was talking about Shinobi death blowing bosses, death blowing bosses is a weird <laughs> phrase. Uh, it, the reason I was talking about it though was because it was basically really easy to cheese my way through about 15, 20 hours of the game. I was getting through on pure luck. I was getting through on cheesing bosses, exploiting bosses, and I wasn't actually growing as a player. I wasn't actually learning the combat or mastering it. And eventually, and you know what's so funny is I was just reading the comments on this story before we started um, doing this podcast, and there was other people um, talking about the same thing. They're like, oh my God, this exact same boss was the same. And I won't spoil (laughs) anything, but this one particular boss is just like, he's an optional boss too, which is so funny that we all got hung up on Mm -hmm, him. mm -hmm. But anyway, this one optional boss is just like, no man, fuck you. You're going to learn how to play this game right now or else you're not going to beat me. (laughs) And so I kept trying this boss, kept trying this boss, and I just couldn't get past him. And so finally, like he was just kicking my ass so hard. He was so aggressive. Nothing I could do would work. And finally I was like, 
there was a there was a tool tip that was sort of like the shinobi is about like the the combat style of the shinobi is about overwhelming your opponent with attacks and with the way the posture system works in this game where you basically like every time an opponent blocks an attack they their posture meter grows and if they block too many attacks without getting a breather in or taking a rest then their posture breaks and then that opens them up for like a shinobi death blow which is a one hit kill um and so i i kind of was like Oh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to try something in this battle. I'm just going to be hella aggressive. Like, I am just going to go at this dude like I have an axe to grind, a katana to grind. And yeah. I went into that fight, and that next, like, that that one attempt, I just went in, and I was like, I'm just going to go balls out. I'm just going to swing my sword like mad, and I'm just not going to give him an inch. And uh, I was able to defeat him in that one time, and I was like, oh, my God. And since then, like, you and I were laughing about this yeah. last night because... I was like high last night. Like <laughs> I, I beat that guy, and it was like I, I, I like tasted blood. I tasted his blood, and I was like overwhelmed with power. And I was like, I became a, a, a demon monster. And I just went around Sekiro to all these other bosses that had been giving me a lot of trouble, and I hadn't been able to beat. And James, you did the same thing. Yeah. Because we were like feeding off of each other's like <laughs> energy too at this point. Like I, I, we both turned into bloodthirsty demons yep. and I just went off and I banged out like two or three bosses, one after the other that had been giving me trouble. You and I both beat one boss on our first try. Yeah. Like we had gone back, we hadn't fought her in a, in a little while. It had been a couple of hours for me, like maybe even as much as 10. And I hadn't fought her and I went back and first try. I went through both phases and I just Jeez. fucked her shit up and yeah. it felt so good. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Like uh, as soon as it, it, it's, it's weird. And, and you talk about this in, in your pieces, we, we are coming in with like this, this training and these expectations from dark souls to, to wait for the opening. And like you said, in your piece, secure is all about creating the opening. You want to get up yeah. in there and, and just wear them down and until they have no options left and, and they make a desperate move that you already know how to counter perfectly and expose their weakness. Um, it's so empowering. It's I so love empowering. this combat style. Cause yeah, Dark Souls combat is all about like trying to just survive. You're, you're dodging attacks. You're trying to conserve stamina in case you might need to use it. And Sekiro is like, does away with all of that. And it's like, no, 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 no. You just want to go like go hard on that enemy and just keep attacking them. If they try and attack back, you just deflect that attack and then keep attacking them and you just overwhelm them. And it's so empowering. Like it's, it's honestly intoxicating yes. the first time that that kind of clicks. And you just like, especially when it's an enemy that or a boss that you've really been struggling with to suddenly like flip this script and it's like no i am the boss now like <laughs> you should be scared of I, I like i am the one who knocks and like it is it's it's uh, like that last night was the moment i wrote that story last night shortly after having that experience and that was the moment where i was like nope sekiro might be my favorite farm software game i'll have to see how the it, the back yeah. half of it goes it's up there for sure and i think i don't know like besides the combat system which we've established as the best in the series, like for, easily for me. Um, uh, sorry, my cats are going buck wild right now, but uh, the, the <laughs> I, I'm surprised. They just beat bosses in Sekiro too. Pr pretty much. Uh, uh, is the level design is, is really like really interesting to me. Um, at first, again, I think those first like 10 hours, it's like pagodas at night or pagodas in winter. And it's like, okay, what, what else you got? But it slowly starts like all the weird, and again, I won't be specific, starts oozing in in small ways and the mythical folklore aesthetic and, and creatures and, and, and people and themes yeah. really start, it starts to feel like uh, logic is dissolving and reality is sort of like uh, just wearing away and, and, and you're, you're just kind of moving through this like dreamlike environment without being too like, again, like you said, it's not like, there's a big ice castle in the distance or it's a under underground lava castle. Um, it never yeah. gets so Western fantasy, but it's, it's so restrained and somehow so that with, with, with that stuff that when it happens and you see some of those stranger things that it is so much more powerful and, and, and stark to me. Um, I like that it's a lot more subtle. Like yeah. most of the opponents you're fighting are humans. There's not like a weird sort of like there's not a lot of monsters, especially compared to like Bloodborne, which no. is literally just like you Fine are ticks, 
with faces. Yeah, and, you're yeah. you're fighting wolves, like werewolves and giant lightning dogs and <laughs> and like all sorts of like crazy batshit things. Uh, but I like I kind of like that they're taking a step back and like it's a much more muted, yeah. sort of more somber game. Have you noticed? Uh, so I don't know if you have noticed, but after you beat a certain boss, uh, I'll say his name because I mentioned him in the article, Genichiro. I yeah. feel like it's pretty obvious that you're gonna fight that dude. Have you noticed that the level the Ashina Castle, and maybe I'm crazy, has gotten significantly like more snowy? Yes. No. That that struck me. So there are okay. things like that. There is. Again, and it kind of reinforces like you're you're in the shit while it's happening, because it, it feels like you're you're passing through time and, and things are changing much more often. There there are more yeah. NPCs all over. There's more like sort of adventure gamey elements and, and quest lines with them. Um, some of them are really weird and some of them are really sad. And I feel like I'm talking to people and finding objects and bringing them to people and and, and really spending time, uh, yeah, talking to them more often and seeing them change. As as the story uh, kind of moves through those big those big beats, like uh, it's a bit more like blunt too. Like I, yeah. I I find like a character is like oh like there people are a bit more overt about their like motivations. So a character is like oh like here's this item, and it's not like in Dark Souls where you just get this item and you're like what the hell do I do with this thing? <laughs> it, you're now like oh I get this item, and now I immediately understand like oh I got some rice. I'm gonna go give it to this lady that was explicitly asking me for rice earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which I, I get some people might be like no that's not the Dark Souls way, but it, like it's just it's different. It's nice. I like that they're doing new things that they're not sticking to the weird like vague, um, you know, obtuse. You don't have to go to a wiki to really get what's going on. Yeah, uh, but there's a lot yeah. of that, that sort of history and depth there that you can look into, um, especially with some of the individual levels that I think come after the Genichiro moment. Um, yeah, is they each have their much more like Bloodborne and Dark Souls sort of have their own uh, internal storyline going on that you you kind of pick up through the environment in those subtle ways uh, and and more overt ways, but. Um, it's it's a lot of fun to just work through those and sort of see the progression of these images and and uh, colors and and you know things that are not uh, as overt and and kind of pick up on what's going on or what happened to that place or is happening to that place. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So overall, like I don't know, I, we still have I, I guess plenty to play through. I don't know exactly where we're at in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, I'm at 30 hours so far. Uh, you, man. I think I'm somewhere in the 20s with you. Um, yeah. But, you know, I would be happy to play this for far, far more. I know it, and it depends on, like, your sort of skill, like, inherent skill and, and able ability. Um, but uh, our reviewer, Tom Sr., spent, like, 72 hours uh, getting through the story. And there's, like, a ton of weird annexes and, like, uh, branches in, in, in these levels. Um that take you to mini bosses and, 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 and weird little set pieces that I think people are going to be digging up for a, a while. Um, it, it is like as, as a world design to me, it's one of the more interesting worlds uh, they've created, like the, more interesting to explore and, and mysterious than I, I think Dark Souls 3 like was a little, a little too linear. Dark Souls 2 was sort of that spoke design and some of that is here too but they they connect interconnect it in, in interesting ways that kind of recall the original dark souls um in some pretty cool ways but uh yeah sprawling sprawling environment yeah yeah uh any final thoughts on on this this beautiful game that we love and and just can't get enough of i i just can't Honestly, I just Stephen, you've been waking up at like four in the morning or some shit to play this. I I, I woke up at four in the morning this morning <laughs> to play. <Sakura. laughs> I played it for five hours yeah. before I started work. It was yeah. wonderful. It was everything I wanted. Uh, I'm sick. I'm really. I'm wrong. I'm bad. Uh, don't be like me. Don't be like me. No, I people. I think it's great. I think people should give it a try. I think uh you know if you're I'm seeing so many people that are like, I just don't feel like I'm getting it. And I was like, I felt the same way. And maybe you won't actually ever come around to it. But now I've come around to it. And I really like it. And, you know, for the first time, I feel like in Dark Souls and in, in From Software history, I'm like genuinely enjoying a lot of the boss battles. Some of them yep. are still horrific. 
like traumatic experiences <laughs> but like i felt like that was all boss battles in bloodborne and yeah. all the dark souls games like i don't i would never want to just go back and replay a boss battle i like the stuff that's in between the boss battles uh more than anything yeah it is Everyone's it is different though it feels to me like uh a game built around oh my god why am i uh what's the what's the artor artorius right uh, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. Atorius yeah, of the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and, and from Dark Souls 3. Uh, like duels. Yeah, it is a game built around duels with a few exceptions. Yeah. And like that sort of the best boss battles in Dark Souls, the entire series, and Bloodborne, like Maria, uh, were all duels. They were all like sort of on even ground um, and were built around these like quick reactions and sort of rhythms. Um, yeah. It didn't matter what kind of build you had, you, you could you could learn those rhythms and, and react to them in really satisfying, uh, satisfying ways. And Sekiro was like taking that idea and just making a fucking game about it. And it's, yeah. it's constantly surprising me. I'm so excited to get back in there and ignore my responsibilities. It's, it's, it's best boss battles are a rhythm game. You're yeah. a rhythm game that like you get to determine the rhythm, which yes. is like, like I said, very empowering and exciting. And I, I love it. And I can't wait to finish work tonight yep. and go back to it. Um, but we'll shut up about it. We have a ton of coverage on the site, and we'll have <laughs> yeah. more incoming uh, for for sure as long as we have stuff to talk about. And there's plenty I st still want to talk about in, in Sekiro. Sekiro? Sekiro? I'm hearing all sorts of... Ooh, I, I feel like even today on the podcast, I've switched four times. <laughs> I mean, it's it's Japanese, so it would be Sekiro. Seki Sekiro. 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 Okay. Se Sekiro. Well, I'm not going to do that. Sekiro, but, uh, Sekiro. Like Sekiro. The... Like what, Steven? Like, like uh, what's her name? Shakira. Not Shakira. Twain. Shakira. <laughs> Shakira. 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 Ah, My deflects don't lie. <laughs> Shinobi death blow inside. Keep going. <laughs> Just keep, <laughs> keep going, that, Steven. Uh, that, uh, I don't know the. It's secure, it's secure. I don't know. No, don't actually keep going. Like, stop. <laughs> oh, stop. oh, shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I wanted you to keep going. <laughs> Uh, My bad. I misread the situation. <laughs> we got to move on. Let's move on to questions. Because uh, we, yeah. we got a little pile of them here. Um, if you don't know, uh, wait, I haven't even said the club yet. Uh, we do we do uh, prioritize questions from the PC Gamer Club. But if we have time in Twitch chat, just tag PC Gamer. Any questions about computer gaming, throw them at us, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, we do prioritize questions from the PC Gamer Club Discord, if you don't know what that is. The PC Gamer Club, I mean. Uh, go to club.pcgamer.com to find out more. Just a small subscription service that supports us directly. Could see a lot of cool stuff, like an ad-free experience on the site. I should just record a commercial for this and, and uh, get some good sound bites yeah. in there and uh, just play that. But, uh, yeah, digital sub to the magazine. Um, uh, ad-free experience on the site. Uh, a cool RPG book we, we put together. Um, free game each month. Um, direct line to me through our Discord. Yeah, uh, and it's you cool. Can talk club. to all of us. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Four a.m. Send me a message, baby. I'll be up. Yeah, and he, he has to hero. Yeah, uh, it's part of my contract. <laughs> uh, but let's get to the first cue here. <laughs> a so we have a, a member of the the club called a legitimate doctor, uh, a perfectly legitimate doctor. I think is what they usually go by, but. They must. You can always tell what they're playing because this week it's a Warframe-ly legitimate doctor. I and, love that. And they ask, uh, uh, it's a question for Steve. Uh, hey. What is slash are Steven's favorite story is from Eve Online? And you've got a whole yeah. bunch of those, huh? Yeah. So I'm going to quickly shill uh, this hub page that I made <laughs> uh, called The Greatest Stories of Eve Online. I'm dropping it in the chat for you guys. Uh, you can just go to Eve Online or PCGamer.com slash Eve hyphen online hyphen stories. It's really easy. That sort of has uh, most of my big Eve Online feature reporting I've done. So if you like reading cool stories about exploding spaceships, my favorites, though, I'm looking at this list to make sure I don't miss anything. I think my, my favorite 
was the one about how a scam in EVE Online turned into its greatest rescue mission, oh. which is the story of this famous scammer. His name is Scooter McCabe. He's like world renowned for just being the biggest scammer in the game. He does these elaborate like month long, um, like long cons where he'll pretend to be your friend using like multiple characters and doing all this crazy stuff. And so he was sent on a mission by like sort of his boss to go scam this guy who had sort of personally insulted uh, an acquaintance of theirs. Mm. And so he infiltrated his corporation and found out that it was basically like a new player labor camp where this guy was <laughs> going into like the systems where new players, when you join EVE Online for the first time, you're kind of only put into one of uh, four systems of the 7,000 that exist in this game. Uh, and so he was going to these specific systems and it's very common that people will go there and be like, hey, new player, like let us help you out like come join our group because there's power in numbers and so it's we both benefit so this guy was doing that but he was then taking these new players out into like the deep trenches of unexplored space kind of and uh just forcing them to do like menial labor and then was taking all of the money that they earned and was just using it for himself and so when he discovered this he was like well shit i can't just scam this guy it's not good enough to do that i also have to liberate these new players uh and so he orchestrated this incredible like coup that caused this alliance to like fall to pieces but then these new players ended up being stranded in space and so then he also organized like this rescue mission where like a hundred players got together and formed a fleet and they like rolled down there and like kicked down the front door to this uh this dictator's uh home system and and rescued all the new players and brought them home and, and got them into friendly alliances so that one's called how a scam and eve online turned into its greatest rescue mission you can find it on the eve hyphen online hyphen stories hub on pcgamer.com uh yeah that's probably my favorite one that one was crazy when he came to me I, I know scooter and when he came to me and said oh boy i have a story i need to tell you <laughs> and i was like yeah what happened and obviously like i corroborated the details with other people but when he first like typed it out i was like jesus what? christ like <laughs> what did you do man like i leave you alone for a month that's but anyway great. uh most of those yeah. are worth reading so just like if you have a like one of those rainy sunday afternoons or something uh just get a cup of coffee, get a, cu a cup of tea, and sit down with the Stevens words. They're great. Um, Thank you. Clever asks, uh, we, we sort of addressed this, and I don't know if we can really answer this, but uh, it's an interesting thought. Do you think that Google really cares about gaming enough that it will make a dent in the current status quo? And this is, again, in relation to uh What do you think, Stadia. Bob? Yeah, uh, I think they care enough that I think that they, I think it'll make money for them probably like uh, otherwise they wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if they really care about gaming. Um, I mean, they, they did, you know, they hired Jade Raymond to run or to, I, I think like lead the Google game studio or whatever. That's one thing that we didn't mention earlier oh, is they're right. like yeah, yeah. launched a, an in-house studio to develop games specifically for stadia um right. but like in in a lot of ways that was just you know hiring a big name talent to back their thing yeah uh so yes and no like time will tell yeah if time will they tell. have the money to uh give i think they care I think they care as much about gaming in the sense that like as long as it will make the money and they will go to any means including destroying the status quo for that to happen. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a massive yeah. entertainment industry and it would be weird if they didn't tap into it somehow and continually try to. So, I mean, if if Steady doesn't do it, then something down the line might um logic bomb 82. We've got a crazy uh, a good first quarter of releases so far in 2019, 2019. What is, what are all of your favorite Gotti Game of the Year candidates thus far? Sekiro. Sekiro. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. James, was was that Sekiro dying twice? Was that Shadows Die Twice? You say it and then you kind of died and then you came back and said it again. <laughs> I was miming it. I was miming it. Uh, I thought you were trying to do like a drive by, like Sekiro. Uh, yeah, Sekiro for me. I mean, it's like a, it, it's early in the year still, but it is also like a 
from game, which kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm inclined to like to begin with, but it's surprising me in ways that most games, no one else is doing what they're doing, making yeah. games in this way and and making like bespoke combat sword systems it, that are extremely successful and putting that in a, a detailed, massive world. Um, so for me, yeah. I mean, Division 2 was like bubblegum good. Um, no yeah, problems. like Division 2 is good. I don't know if I'm going to die on that hill come game of the year time resident evil 2 is extraordinarily good <laughs> i really liked resident evil 2 um I'm trying to think of what else has come out i mean like apex legends was like out of nowhere yeah, and is amazing yeah. Yeah. for me apex is the front runner right now like I, i'm loving that game still doing it uh, is it is it at a point where everyone's so good that you can't play anymore or is it still fairly you get some good games at that in? point I think it's it's still fairly doable. Like yeah. I've gotten a lot better for one thing, um, and uh, when I get paired up with other people who know what they're doing, like we generally win. But the, one of the biggest problems is getting paired with people who just run off by themselves and Ugh. die. It's, it's weird that <laughs> uh, happens at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. I mean, that's one of the problems with a with it being you know squad based, and that a lot of people want a a solo or a duo mode. Personally, I I love squads. Like, and most of the time, I do play with at least one other person, and the the two of us like we can do fairly well, just the two of us. But like yeah. that third person can, yeah. Like I, you know, I'm not shroud or dizzy or whatever, where I can just break off and solo a team easily. Like I need to coordinate with my teammates against a another team but yeah but yeah um it's it's really fun though i'm i still enjoy it a lot i, gotta get I just want to yeah me too so i just gotta it. point out that like this has been probably one of the craziest quarters for triple a yes. releases in terms of quality i mean anthem was a total bust but like <laughs> devil may cry was oh it, yeah i forgot it's so good dude i i Whoa. did too i i was literally Whoa. looking at like best new games of 2019 lists and i saw devil may cry i was like that game is incredible and i forgot it existed <laughs> devil may cry 5 is fantastic um uh what else was there metro exodus yeah. i yeah. beat that and i thoroughly enjoyed it it you know it's a little janky i don't think it's game of the year but like there's just like every game that's come out has been really good, which is yeah. funny because I feel like that segues into our next question. Uh, I do want to give a quick shout, real quick. Uh, uh, yeah, Chris eighty six does say some great indies came out this year. Baba is you, Devotion, yeah. uh, and Sun the Skies. So there's, I mean, like all across the board, I think it's been a wild. We like give out so nine, so many nineties already, and like PC Gamer doesn't give out nineties often. Um, yeah, next question. Let's segue away. So, Pendo. Hey, Pendo. Pendo's a local um, here in Eugene, and we get beer sometimes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so many good games came out in the last month that I want to play. How do I prioritize which one to play right now and which ones to get later? I feel you. I'm pulling out my hair. What do you guys do? Yeah. What determines what, – how do you d construct your own hierarchy of uh, gaming? Oh. <laughs> Arbitrarily. <laughs> yeah, like games like Devil May Cry 5 – uh, because they're like a story game, uh, I know that the story isn't like particularly amazing. Like it's not like this focal point that I, I think is going to define 2019, even though it's a really good game. Yeah. That's like a game that I'm like, well, cool. I'll go back to that once I've beat Sekiro, once like things have sort of calmed down a bit. Um, so that's typically how I prioritize things. Ultimately, it's just like what I find the most fun or like whatever my gut tells me. Um, I'm definitely like a game drifter where I just kind of go to whatever's <laughs> new and shiny. I'm a gaming magpie. Uh, so, yeah, I don't really have, like, a, a technique. I just kind of go from one thing to the other. I am trying to beat more games this year. So when Good. I do invest in a game, I want to see it through to the end. And I think maybe that's important. It doesn't matter what you play just as long as – well, no, don't play something to the end just because you feel obligated to do it. I don't know, man. I can't tell you how to play your games, Pendo. You do you, man. <laughs> Great. <That's my> advice. <laughs> oh, do you have, uh, do you have some kind of – rule set I, not really game? like i'm i'm not the person to ask this because i tend to just get one game and play it forever and not not forever but like i played nothing but overwatch for a long time yeah. and uh and then i would take a break from that to either play through i would like get into something like i don't know i the i think the first one that tore me away from overwatch way back was like 
when a new when like XCOM two or War of the Chosen mm-hmm. or something came out, I like dove into that for a while, and then I went back to Overwatch and, um, yeah, like recently it's been it's been Apex has been that like I'm just playing that if I have free time, like I want to play Apex, and then if there's no one on, like if I don't have any of my friends on to play with, then I'll probably just like grab something on Switch and like usually like I I just play the indie games. Like I love indie like indie games and these small type games, but I mostly want to play them like on handheld, sitting on the couch rather than at my desk that I've been sitting at for you know twelve hours all day. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I tend to wait for these games to to come to Switch. So like that was that was me recently with like Hollow Knight with Dead Cells. Uh, now um, Moonlighter, the one I was talking about earlier, uh, it was Stardew. You know, a year or two ago. Um, I feel so yeah, I, I tend to have like a a PC game that I just keep coming back to, and then I alternate between those and like the couch game that I'm playing on Switch. Right. Yeah, I mean that's I have I have no rules either. And Pendo is in chat and says, "How much does FOMO drive your decisions?" That's like what drives all of my decisions. Um, <laughs> I just I want I want the new hotness most of the time because uh, I I'm just so fascinated by what this industry puts out um and and sort of the trends and i like to be like i like to be able to talk about it with other people so i I just love being part of the conversation um i think that that fomo like actually has somewhat driven me to not play a lot of games because in a roundabout way because like basically like after you know this conversation everything i've been reading about sekiro like i'm like that that game sounds really cool like i want to play it but also that's the type of game that I would like pick up six months from now when it's on sale or something. And then, yeah. so like there's one part of me that's like, I want to wait until it's on sale or, or I can grab a copy or like until I'm not playing something else mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, but then by the time that happens, I've like missed the window to experience it alongside you guys. So yeah. like th- th- this definitely happened to me with, monster hunter world for example like when that game came out like steven and wes and i can't remember if you were playing it too james like a lot of people on the team were playing that i was like oh this game sounds really cool like i had never gotten into a monster hunter game before but like maybe this will be the one that that i want that i get into but like by the time i wasn't playing something else and it kind of rolled around i was like nobody else is playing it anymore i was like well i've kind of missed the window so now i'm probably just not going to play that game and I, you know, still haven't. So maybe, maybe I'll pick up Sekiro tomorrow or tonight and get into it now while while it's in the zeitgeist. Or maybe I'll never play it at all. Who knows? <laughs> Just trust your heart, Penda. Listen to your heart. Yeah, when it's calling for you, listen to your heart. There's nothing more you can do. I feel like anytime I, I just I bait Stephen with those those lyric callouts. Um, Man, you should so know by easy. now. There's nothing that revs my engine quite like '90s EDM. <laughs> um, let's move on to. We got time for like one or two more. But uh, Z, how do you think huge tech companies like Google and Amazon getting into game development will impact the industry? Hmm. Let's put on our uh, analyst glasses and hats and uh, pretend we like oh, we know what will happen. Persona Five. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we. Uh, we talked about this earlier some, but but the the answer is we don't know, but it will be a question that we have to grapple with. Like the the main kind of situation that I'm thinking about is like, what if Stadia, you know, is a total hit and it like provides a perfect one to one, like you know, the playing on Stadia is like un indistinguishable from playing on a high end local machine, like. If that's the case, like, what incentive do we have to build a two thousand dollar computer anymore when I can just stream it? Like, know. you know, know, obviously we're not there yet, but like, yeah. what if we get to that point? Like, you know, hardly anybody buys DVDs anymore. Like, nobody buys CDs because why would you? You know, the the music industry had to change to ad- adapt to the streaming apocalypse. Yeah. And and so did the, the the movie industry and uh, like 
the games industry might have to too we'll we'll see yeah what that looks like is gonna be a little scary a little fascinating maybe good maybe very bad i don't know like uh we're in it together at this point like it's, it's just really it's it's a matter of what kind of force and commitment these companies put in into whatever specific projects and, and goals they have and none of that stuff is super clear yet and and i think you know we're all we're all staring down you know the barrel of that uh, particular gun wow that sounds yep. really grim yeah be, holy it shit fine. it might be fine what a way to know. end the show i just don't trust anyway big companies scare me uh, oh yeah i don't trust the, i wouldn't trust google with anything yeah. i trust them with everything they have complete access to all my emails uh yeah yeah remember that part where google changed their motto from don't be evil oh yeah right That's it used to be that reply. it's not that anymore <laughs> They were like, eh, you could be a little evil. Just, just sprinkle gotta. some evil in, you know. This is 2019, baby. Evil's sexy. <laughs> it is. I like a little evil in my life. Um, but that's about all the time we have for Hail Satan. today. Hail Satan. <laughs> on the PC Gamer Show. Uh, you can always join us here on twitch.tv slash PC Gamer at 1 p.m. Pacific time. What is that, 4 Eastern? Uh, at uh, every Wednesday. Did I say Wednesday? Who cares? Um, and uh, after the fact at youtube.com slash pcgamer we put that VOD up for you um, you can also find us at pcgamer.com slash tag slash podcast uh, we have a new feed we are not on iTunes you cannot search us on iTunes but you can add our feed uh, add our podcast through the iTunes podcast app you just need our you need our feed we will get on iTunes again someday it's just a fucking nightmare and I say this every week it's a fucking nightmare uh, but you can find us elsewhere too like Spotify um, and Google Play uh, and we're working on getting pretty much everywhere you can find podcasts um, so however you want to listen to us you can and that's that's cool that's great uh, but until next week um, and gosh what are we going to be talking about next week are there any more games coming out are we are we beyond the Sort of. I th I th I think we might actually be through it now. We might be through it. Hell. I don't know if there's a major release coming up in April that I'm. Okay. There's always more games. <laughs> let's just let's just take a breather at least, and uh, we might we might have a little more time to uh, just kind of meditate on on different topics and, and instead of talking about the new hotness. So that'll be nice. Hopefully we get Chris yeah. on to talk outward because I'm really fascinated by that that game. But uh, yeah, until then, uh, keep on grinding and don't forget to. Game on. Shinobi Deathblow. Shinobi Deathblow. Yeah. All right. No. No? All right. See you guys. Game on. Game on. <laughs>